The details of that because I figured this would be the right place. Thank you. Okay, here we go. My name's Kieran Gilbert. I'm from Sky News. I'm the chief political reporter there, and I'm hosting the uh, politics and foreign policy discussion this afternoon. As uh, our Japanese visitors uh, and friends would know, we are now on to our seventh prime minister in the last <laughs> decade. And it's like the roles have reversed with Japan from 2006 to 2012. December 2012, when Shinzo Abe took over, uh, you had a prime minister every year. And it looks like things have have reversed and uh, one thing I want to ask our panel this, this morning is how has Abe achieved that stability? Is it likely to continue for the foreseeable future? Uh, one thing, well a few things that we have in common as uh, nations, our uh, reliance in terms of a very strong economic relationship with China, but parallel to that, our, in a security sense, our alliances with the United States. So there are, there are similarities. We also, as nations, are grappling with the Trump presidency, and, uh, and uh, Sheila touched on this as well, but Shinzo Abe, one of the world leaders who's been able to manage that relationship, although not without its, uh, its side effects, not the least of which the tariffs on steel and al aluminium. And as, as uh, Professor Drysdale pointed out as well, the prospect of tariffs on automobiles. This morning, I have Dr. Luli Miura from the University of Tokyo with me, Dr. Sheila Smith, as you know, from the Council of Foreign Relations, and Mr. Hiroyuki Akita from Nikkei. Please put your hands together. We'll start with some opening remarks from Luli and Hiro. Uh, we've heard from Sheila, so we'll, we'll get into some questions with her in a moment as well. But uh, Luli, if I could start with some opening remarks from you okay. for this morning. Uh, thank, thank you. you. I'm Luli Mira from the University of Tokyo. Nice to meet you all. And thank you for the kind inv invitation. And I was overwhelmed by Sheila's <laughs> comprehensive, passionate, thoughtful uh, remarks. But I will stick to my <laughs> um, opening remarks. Uh, when thinking about regional order and regional security and Japan's role, I think three perspectives or elements that are critical. First and most important is the U.S. retreat um, from East Asia. I think the change had happened after the 2006 midterm elections. Uh, from them, a lot of things happened in Asia. The U.S. is a democracy, thus making it a democratic empire. In this context, not only is the U.S. capability important, but equally important as well to continue to be an empire. The emergence of Trump and the Republican Party and the enthusiasm <coughs> mirrored around Bernie Sanders on the democratic side is a clear sign of shifting priority in the U.S. to maintain such an empire. I do not believe that U.S. will simply let go of its grips as the dominant power in the world to China. Its recent focus on economic pressure towards China or its rebuilding of prominence in the techno technology sphere is a clear sign that it doesn't intend to do so. <coughs> From the security perspective, the U.S. modernization of nuclear arsenals, investment in technology, AI cyberspace, warfare, is a sign of its imperial resolve, but that doesn't necessarily translate into regional hegemony in East Asia. That's an important point, I think. Besides, the U.S. military deterrence cannot deter the type of salami slicing tactics deployed by China. The second factor that will shape Asia is China's continued economic growth <coughs> and continued power projection on the security arena. As many experts have pointed out, the quiet diplomatic philosophy of not too exerting excessive influence is over. Xi Jinping's China <coughs> is quite different from Deng Xiaoping's China. I don't necessarily blame China for its ambition because China is a big country. However, I do fear that that will mean for, what that will mean for the world order, especially in Asia. The post-World War II world led by the U.S. for all its shortcomings tried to recreate the world in its own image. Democratic principles, free and open trade, and the rule of law were pillars that made up the world. 
US allies such as the G7 countries and <coughs> countries like Australia were given preferential status in this world. Unlike the pre-war bloc economies, Japan was given access to US markets that enabled its post-war recovery. What would the world look like in which China creates in its own image? Cut slowed economic competition, state-dominated decision-making, <coughs> the prominence of order over human rights, a hierarchical approach to international society coming immediately, immediately to mind. <coughs> These realities are already taking root in areas that China has established economic dominance, for example, in the continental states within ASEAN. Will the current international order be able to sustain the principles it has established over the last 70 years? There are definitely signs of encouragement, such as the TPP-11 process, where Japan and Australia jointly showed leadership. Having said that, I must confess, I am less optimistic of the long-term trend. The third element is Japan's ambivalence. Japan's approach towards uh, this rapidly changing Asia is ambivalent at best, or more simply put, domestically divided. On the one hand, there is the Abe administration and the Japan's ruling elites that base incrementalism as a basic as the basis for creating policy. The objective for regional policy is to maintain the status quo as long as possible. The US retreat is either neglected or minimized in importance. There's no real drive towards wider independence either. This view is more or less represented in the main factions in the looting LDP and bureaucracy. On the other side, you have a reluctant isolationism, I named it, embodied by the liberal-leaning media and the opposition parties. The pacifist sentiment characterized post-war Japanese public opinion as deteriorating. Today, an overwhelming majority of the Japanese public is about 80% hate China. It's a surprising number. All the while, the anti-US sentiment evident among the left is still prominent. Thus, the Japanese left neither likes the Americans or the Chinese, doesn't want to build up an independent defense capability of its own, nor do they want to pursue market-oriented reforms to re-establish Japanese economic productivity. In the short term, the incrementalist in power will pursue a reactive yet stable policy, I think. Even as we speak of US retreat, of course, no one in the US Navy's Indo-Pacific fleet is going to admit US lack of resolve in Asia. So the desire to maintain or cling to the old world order is understandable, but the world is changing. So Abe administration will gradually increase defense spending and allocate much of that towards the purchasing <coughs> expensive US weapons system. Although I assume that US-Japan relationship will become much more stressful and sour after the midterms in the US. There will be increased pressure on trade. In any case, unrealistic pressure in the economic arena will reopen Japanese assertiveness not seen since the 1990s. What will be difficult for the administration and the incrementalists is that Japan <coughs> has to confront a Trump-led, often unreasonable US in the age of increasing dependence on the security side. This is likely to be quite difficult politically. So I gave you a dim view about Japan but I am eager to discuss. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also <coughs> conduct the um, large-scale opinion poll every three, three years to Japanese public, Korean public, and Chinese um, public. So I have some numbers. So if you have some question about the you know, opinion, uh, please ask me. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Nobu.
thank you, very, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, many of my friends in Tokyo envy me, not only because Australia is a beautiful um, country and the Australian wine is delicious, but uh, this is <laughs> winter here in Australia. You know about the Japanese crazy summer. It is still like uh, 38, or 30, 37 degree. And so, you know, uh, that, that's why they envy. But anyway, I have to go back. So I have to go to Hanoi after this. So maybe, yeah, uh, I'm really happy to be here. And anyway, <laughs> to be serious, um, I'd like to uh, keep my uh, comment quite short uh, so that we can have more time for discussion. But I'd like to make a two points. One is uh, how Japanese government perceive Trump administration. And secondly, how Japanese government tried to deal with or adapt, or react, or adapt uh, to this reality. Uh, so since I'm a journalist, so I'd rather speak uh, based on my observation or conversation with uh, policymakers or politicians. So basically, this is a Trump shock, uh, maybe bigger than Nixon shock, I think. And uh, I, we have to go into the detail of that you know, shock. But uh, basically, Trump is, uh, Japanese policymakers now increasingly uh, started to realize that Trump phenomenon is not, Trump himself is not the cause of problem, but the symptom, uh, sorry to say symptom, reflection. <laughs> reflection of US changing US foreign policy. So uh, that will continue. And uh, maybe it is uh, due to the series of war uh, in Afghanistan or Iraq, Middle East, after 9-11. Uh, so, uh, American, uh, U.S. Uh, have a kind of war fatigue, and while there is an uh, income gap widening in the U.S. So it will continue. Uh, maybe uh, American first policy will continue beyond Mr. Trump. And secondly, but so initially, uh, when I talk with government officials, they always talk about how to endure how to endure Trump administration period and how to deal with it. And um, Mr. Abe uh, met uh, Mr. Trump like uh, eight times and also talked on the phone like uh, 26 times. It is extraordinarily frequent. And the assumption was that Abe, as he communicate more and more, he can change Mr. Trump's mindset or policy. But now, uh, as I said, it is a He's a reflection of a deeper change. So I think I have realized that uh, he cannot change Mr. Trump. Not only his mindset, but his policy. <coughs> so uh, that is why he will try to meet more and more, at least try to minimize the risk. <coughs> and, uh, yeah, so also a Trump shock is that uh, we cannot take, uh, Japan cannot free ride, of course not, but also may not be able to cheap ride on the US security umbrella. Um, maybe Japan have to do more uh, to, and also have to reconsider or adjust the burden sharing. <laughs> so second point is how to deal with uh, the reality. Uh, basically, to put it more journalistically, uh, Japan, is about to adopt so-called dual hedge approach, dual hedge. hedge. One hedge is to do more to sustain or maintain US-Japan alliance, invest more. So in, on this front, uh, Japan, as uh, Shira said, or uh, Miura-san said, said, Japan will invest more. Uh, next, next, next fiscal year's defense budget will be like a five point, maybe five or six trillion, trillion Japanese yen, which is the biggest in the past. And also Japan will increase amphibious capability uh, and also missile defense in order to sustain US footprint uh, in Japan uh, so that you know, they don't have to worry about vulnerability coming from North Korea or China. So Japan is investing more for the missile defense. It is not only to defend Japan, but also sustain US military presence. And also, amphibious side is that uh, now Japan have realized that uh, maybe when there is a contingency in Senkaku, 
or she island chain, Trump administration may not intervene to help Japan unless Japan invests more to defend by its own. Then uh, maybe when even then we so we'll have to defend by ourselves first. Then US may US may help. So that is a one hedge to the Trump reality. Second hedge is more interesting. As Shira mentioned, uh, Japan is trying to minimize the risk of the war, or risk of high tension with China, and also Russia. Uh, when U.S. Uh, when when uh, we can, uh, when U.S. can assure strong military or political commitment to this region, maybe Japan didn't have to worry about so much to uh, deal with this reality. But now we cannot count on that. So Abe tries to uh, minimize tension with China as much as possible. That's why he is visiting maybe Beijing October 23rd. And also uh, maybe, not maybe, it is very likely that uh, Xi Jinping will visit Japan for the first time in past 10 years. Um, also, uh, Abe is visiting Russia again. I think that he met uh, with Putin more than 20 times bilaterally, including his first term as a prime minister. And uh, I don't think that he has hope that Putin will return for islands back. I don't think so. He is not that stupid. But uh, <laughs> the reason why he keeps meeting, he keeps meeting Putin is to minimize the risk. Japan doesn't want to have a two-front confrontation vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia. And another hedge is to push forward uh, TPP-11, and maybe Japan will reach out to ASEAN countries, including Indonesia. Indonesia. Indonesia and Thailand have already hinted that they are willing to negotiate, and also even UK. And also, uh, Japan was very skeptical to a BRI, Belt and Road Project, a Belt and Road Initiative, but now, uh, later this month, I think they will meet in China and Japanese officials will meet in Thailand to discuss about the joint project yeah. within the context of BRI. Maybe Japan wouldn't say it's context of BRI, but it's context of BRI to push forward railway project in Thailand. So that is also another uh, change. So to do more to be, to do more to sustain with Japan alliance, but also try to ease tension with China, Russia in case this hedge cannot be effective enough. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Sheila, just to pick up on a few of the themes sure. that Hiro touched on there, um, we know that Abe has uh, said on a number of occasions on the public record his, uh, his keenness to um, see constitutional revision of Article 9, the Peace Clause. Uh, how likely is it that he's able to revise the Constitution? <laughs> So this, is, this could take us the rest of the day. Um, <laughs> briefly, um, public opinion on this moves depending on the moment, right? It is not true that the Japanese public overwhelmingly want to change the Constitution. However, there's, I think, a greater appetite in Japan for a conversation on revision. I don't think we'll know until Abe's you know, suggestion that Article 9 add a paragraph or add a sentence, right? Um, until that gets into the diet, I don't think we'll know whether or not the Japanese, how the Japanese people really feel about it. There's a fairly strong but small group of people who actually want to see the second paragraph of Article 9 seriously revised. So you'll have a debate among the more um, focused critics of Article 9 and, and this new kind of mm, soft approach by Abe. But I don't know that the Japanese people are going to buy into it. There's other political issues coming up at the same time. Hmm. Not sure yet that he's got a, a full consensus on moving forward. Lily, what's your, what are your th thoughts on that? Well, PM Abe is quite eager to change the constitution. The current draft made by the LDP reflects the idea by New Komeito, which is a pacifist uh, <laughs> party in Japan. So um, LDP discussing uh, the draft I try to include the, the certain words that civilian control by the diet. So it might be uh, helpful to get the support from some of the opposition party members. But it is quite political right now. So I think during the fight, um, 
over the changing nine article, it's actually nine two article, <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, to be uh, precise. Um, the Japanese uh, left-leaning op opposition party might lose public support because they have already very limited number of seats and their real intention is quite different from the supporters. Their supporters, the core supporters are pacifist, but the party members of a constitutional democratic party doesn't mind to change, you know, constitution. So it might be a gap between the diet member and the supporters. Okay. So I think it's a close call mm. if the public support the, yeah. I would say, I, I think that the mindset of average Japanese is like this. You know, uh, when I was a kid, kid, maybe my parents choose clothes for me and force me to wear. And then I grew up and I still like this clothes, but I want to choose it by myself. So I go to the department store and buy it by myself with my money. So that is, I think, average, average mindset of the uh, Japanese people. So we don't want to change the design so drastically. But maybe uh, there is a several article which must be adjusted to the reality, uh, like uh, environmental protection or uh, contingency provision and so on. But Article 9 is the one, I think, highly divided. But the essence of Article 9, the renounce of the war, renounce of the war, this part, this design is, I think, largely supported by Japanese people. No Japanese people wants to preemptively attack China or North Korea. Mm. So uh, that is my understanding. So that is the reason why when you look at the poll, it is support to a change of constitution in general is quite high. But the Article 9 is quite highly divided. So not even divided, but I, I, I don't think that people want to change the essence of uh, Article 9. OK. If we look at the uh, domestic politics mm. uh, as well, um, Abe faces a ballot later this month um, to, to continue as president of the LDP and prime minister of the country. Is it a done deal, Sheila, that he remains leader? I, I think that uh, Ishiba Shigeru is running, right? And that's uh, the contender that you know, he ran against in 2012. But I think it's pretty, pretty much predictable that you, Mr. Abe will continue to be prime minister. I think the party is largely in support of his leadership. And in terms of that, do you see another three years of Abe that, that the Japanese thinking is that you can get beyond the Trump mm. blip? Or is the view, like uh, Hiro said, that this is that the shift in the U.S. is much greater than that? Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the average Japanese think about Trump, other than you know, Abe is, seems to be able to manage him. So maybe Abe is a good idea, right? Until we can figure this out. But remember, there's other issues on the table as well. So next year, 2019, there is the abdication of the emperor. It's already decided it's going to happen, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an important moment for Japan. Um, there's the raising of the consumption tax is coming next year. And then there's a very important upper house election. Uh, and so whatever happens on the constitutional debate in the diet, you will be gearing up then for an electoral response to that conversation next summer at the upper house election. So I think we wanna, I think Abe is the best, I mean the, the parties basically thought he can get us through this the best and he can manage whatever right. may come in foreign policy, where he has a pretty strong record. You, you spoke about the fact that you don't think this is just the, that the Trump changes, I guess, in economic a, approach, in America first approach, in, ta in uh, pulling out of the TPP and the tariffs and so on, that you, you feel it's a more fundamental shift in the United States, that's something you're going to have to grapple with for years to come. Um, maybe his tactics impose tariff is very Trump. But uh, for American taxpayer to demand Japan to uh, buy more US pro American product, thereby US can uh, fix its trade imbalance, is, I think, deep rooted to trend. Uh, of course, uh, 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 and uh, also, as Mirasan said, I perceive 
U.S. has been opening market and keep buying a lot of products, the, even though uh, U.S. have a trade deficit. It is partly because of the context, in the context of the Cold War, the U.S. was very generous to allies so that allies can you know, develop economically and politically, militarily. Uh, and uh, because helping ally that way was to help U.S. itself to deter Soviet Union. But China is not Soviet Union. China is a competitor, maybe strategic adversary, at the, at the same time economic partner. So naturally, U.S. have less incentive to be more generous, generous, as generous as U.S. was during Cold War, economically, militarily, everything. That is uh, my perce perception, but I think, I think it is widely shared among the Japanese government people. Can I add sure. the one point? Because uh, there's a dangerous tendency in Japanese public to welcome uh, U.S.-China trade war. Because TV programs is excited about the, you know, the theme, but they don't understand the reality. Because during the Cold War, U.S.-Soviet uh, export-import is less than 1% yeah. of the whole. So. U.S.-China's relationship cannot be Cold War type of relation, but Japanese public, some of the Japanese public don't understand such you know, mm. side of the relationship. Right. So Lily, how, how would you rate Abe's handling of, of Trump? Um, and I remember he went into uh, Trump yeah. Tower, I think presented the president with a gold golf yeah. club. And, since very then, expensive. He's, well, yeah, very expensive one. But he's met him, as you pointed out, uh, but many, many in times. China. Yeah, how would you? <laughs> <laughs> made in China. Japanese brand. <laughs> made in China. <laughs> this is a national. Uh, 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 at the uh, first meeting, first, uh, <laughs> first meeting was uh, President Trump at Malago. Oh. Uh, shortly after uh, Shinzo came home, uh, he was quite excited and he was happy about the relation, new relationship, because President Trump seemed to understand everything about the, the trade issue, ex especially the automobile industry. During the lunch session, he, he brought it up by himself, and he explained everything, as US car doesn't sell well in Japanese market for a reason. And Trump, President Trump seemed to understand it, but that's the first mistake Prime Minister Abe made, because Mr. Trump knows everything. He knows, but he, you know, do the unreasonable demand to Japanese uh, Prime Minister, and he knows that Prime Minister is facing enormous stress from Japanese public, but yet he doesn't want to compromise to Mr. Abe. Mm. So this is very structural. It's not Prime Minister Abe's fault. No. But we were op too optimistic about President Trump. When, when you look at the, the scenario, Sheila, in terms of some of the, the worst case scenarios, like, uh, for example, the, the automobile tariffs right. you touched on mm. in your keynote, and, and even worse than that would be okay. some sort of uh, confrontation that might even say the US withdraw from the US-Japan alliance. Okay. Are those realistic scenarios? <laughs> Gordon accused me of being too soft on Mr. Trump, so let me, let me try to rectify that. Um, I don't think they're optimistic, actually. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think they're unrealistic. So I think there's two things to think about. I am not convinced that the tariff, uh, as an implement of pressure, mm -hmm. is well understood. Mm -hmm. by Trump. Yeah. I mean, I think you can watch, and again, there's others in the room more knowledgeable than I, but I think you can watch the U.S.-China negotiations mm -hmm. and see the miscalculation. I think they amply thought that they were going to be able to get the Chinese into a deal last time the Chinese mission came. Mm -hmm. I, think he's, I think Trump still thinks that way, and you can look at his tweets and his friend, references to friendships with Xi Jinping mm -hmm. and things like that. He still thinks he can broker a deal. Uh, the Chinese today, and all of you here have probably been following the comments that have been made in Beijing lately, Chinese are seeing this as this is yet another piece of the competition that looks like we're inevitably headed towards a Cold War. Mm -hmm. So the interpretation of the Chinese is not a leverage, pressure, let's get to a better deal. The interpretation of high-level Chinese is that we are destined 
to be strategic competitors and, in fact, confrontation. So I doubt that he understands the Japanese position well. I mean, he may understand vulnerability of Japan, and he may not have animus towards Mr. Abe, personally. I don't think he does, frankly. But I think he wants to use the vulnerability of Japan tactically yeah. to American mm. advantage. And it, you can just look at the way that he interacted with Moon Jae-in. The very quiet, under the surface conversation right. with South Korea has been nothing short of bullying, frankly. Mm -hmm. right? Whether it's the opening up of chorus yet again mm -hmm. and the, the pressure, right? Whether it was during the tensions of the missile launches and this, you know, quiet, you have to pay for all of this, mm -hmm. right? Or coming out of the conversation with Kim Jong un making the statement that these war games are expensive. That's a that's a shot across the bow mm -hmm. of the South Korean government who is currently trying to negotiate a, a special measures agreement on how much the South Koreans are going to pay for US troops. Yeah. Okay. So I think there's he tactically uses vulnerability in these alliances. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on here. Yeah. And, and it, I think it's going to blow up if he does this on the autos with Japan because there's too much at stake yeah. for the Japanese. So uh, US-Japan Security Treaty it has uh, not only Article 5, but I think it was Article 20, by which uh, US, either US or Japan can withdraw from the US-Japan US Security Alliance by one year notice. It is unilateral. Either US or Japan can unilaterally withdraw. So it's kind of fragile, fragile treaty, I think. And based on that, uh, yeah, I agree with you. And also, I'd like to add that uh, when I talk with uh, Japanese officials who uh, do the trade negotiation with the Trump administration, uh, they, have, they started to think this way. Mr. Trump has two balance. So yeah, past president have two balance, balance sheet. One balance sheet is trade. And the other one is a security alliance. US have deficit in both of balance sheet. But this is kind of like a sanctuary, and they never mix this together. But in Trump's mind, he combined this together, and his mindset is that Japan is ship riding. And maybe, unlike NATO, Japan cannot increase the defense budget to the 2% of GDP so easily. So let's fix this trade issue, thereby he can offset the deficit in alliance. This is very dangerous, but uh, I think this is the way I understand when the Japanese, I think Japanese people understand, just increasingly understand. So that's why, you know, uh, Washington Post scooped that uh, Mr. Trump uh, told Abe that we will never forget Pearl Harbor in the June meeting at White House. Uh, I, I don't think that that, that was accurate uh, as I uh, kind of uh, checked. Uh, there wasn't that kind of uh, wording in that context. Basically, he said, I, I, as I understand that, I speak right, that he said uh, Japan had the samurai spirit in past. Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Uh, Japan also caused the war. Japan was samurai. And why don't you do more to shut down North Korean missile or defend, you, defend Japan by, by its own? In that context, he mentioned Pearl Harbor. So if it is not so uh, bad, but uh, it's really, it is the reflection of his balance sheet combined together, trade and security. Yes. Lily, the, the, um, the Japanese have been able to uh, weather the tariffs on steel and aluminium. What options are there for Japan if, as Hiro alludes to, Trump tries to fix the balance sheet a bit more in terms of the trade relationship, the trade side of the ledger, and introduce tariffs on automobiles? Well, US export is mainly agriculture and uh, the military uh, products. So one solution is to buy more US military products. And that's what Abesan is doing right now. And the other solution is that we buy more US food, US made food. And in my opinion, Mr. Trump's uh, intention to uh, start trade war is to reform Chinese market and also Japanese market. To be fair, Japanese market is not um, 
open enough. Not automobile industry, but. And also, the, the fact shows that some of the US uh, companies like Coca-Cola, Goldman Sachs, well, can play a fair role in Japanese market. So our rigid um, um, countryside farmers uh, can be changed by Prime Minister Abe's initiative, but then he must face the you know, harsh um, criticism from the conservatives. Mm. So I'm not sure, but Japanese government seem to lack um, fundamental solutions to that. Mm. Do you, Sheila, in, in a broad sense, uh, you know, across a, these various issues, see in the, you know, Trump not attending APEC or the East Asia summit? How, how do you reflect <laughs> on that? <laughs> as little as possible. Um, so, Sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. So he did take the Asia trip, and I think a lot of us understood from the early interaction with our European allies, right? He doesn't like multilateral. He doesn't like multilateral settings. He's not good at it. Doesn't like it. Doesn't like to sit around. Um, and so I wasn't surprised on the Asia trip. He stayed out in the region longer than I thought he was going to do, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, Personally, I, I just, you can see him, you can hear him talk about it. He, his style is the one-on-one. -on -one. It's the Abe or the Shinzo, you know, Donald. <laughs> it's the Vladimir Donald. It's the she, you know, she. That's who he is. That's where he thrives. That's where he thinks he understands the game. So I think we should expect him to do a lot more of that than sitting in large fora discussing regional <coughs> governance issues, right? Um, what I am not sure yet is whether Pompeo and Mattis has largely taken up that slack in the military strategic realm. You know, Secretary Mattis is on the road all the time, uh, making sure that US interests and, and commitments are, 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 are articulated and supported. Um, Pompeo needs probably to do more. I expect in Asia-Pacific regionalism, you will see him once the North Korea thing stops consuming all of his time, right? Yeah. Um, I don't expect Donald Trump is going to, to do that. It's hard to get a US president to the region anyway, whether it's Obama or Bush or Clinton before them, right? You have, you've had disappointments in the region because the US president didn't attend. But I don't think we should have high hopes of, of Trump. Can I get back to one point, though, that I think it's kind of implicit in Hiro's comments as well as, as, as Louis. Japanese expectations of this relationship, and I think you use the word incrementalism, right? that <laughs> incrementalist mindset, and I'm not sure the double hedge is actually what's happening in Japan, but I'm, I'm willing to take your advice on that. It is a difficult time to predict the what next, right? You, you asked in your question about North Korea, I, you know, the minute we have military force used in the region, all bets are off. And that would be with Trump or without Trump, because we've never been there before, right? This is not a war fighting alliance in the same way the US are okay or the NATO alliance is. But that, that close personal relationship is, I, what I thought about Hero's comments that's really important is risk reduction, mm. is minimizing risk, mm. minimizing that disconnect. I don't know, and I'd love to hear more, Ruri, about who in Japan is thinking about the what next? Who is thinking about the big disconnects? Mm -hmm. And is Japan prepared? And how is Japan prepared should it go badly? I don't hear it in public. It could be in private. Um, but I think risk management or minimization, and let's make sure to try to hug Trump close as best we can, I think that's the strategy, mm -hmm. incremental or not. But I think that's the strategy. I don't hear brand new thinking. I don't know mm -hmm. if there's new thinking out here in Australia either. So I'd kind of like to hear from the other side of the alliance mm -hmm. whether or not people see the need for that or they think that Trump is manageable. Mm -hmm. Well, can I? Oh, absolutely. I'm sorry. I just no, <laughs> asked a question. But I, no, no, yeah. Well, as I pointed out in opening remarks, mm -hmm. um, the Japanese pacifist cannot you know, provide any solutions to the future of East Asia, mm -hmm. because they are inward-looking and isolationist. So the alternative to Prime Minister Abe come from the, the segment represented by Ishiba-san. And Ishiba-san is, you know, recently trying to 
sell more independent policy from, from the U.S. And he is thinking about, you know, bringing up the, the change of U.S.-Japan status of force agreement so far. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's exactly a nationalist move. But the thing is that Prime Minister Abe's uh, segment is the most um, future-looking, mm -hmm. forward-looking segment of Japanese political society. And what Ishiba-san is doing right now is to you know, damage the administration by you know, claiming that Trump-Abe relationship mm -hmm. is sour and that Japan has to be more independent. But, well, what kind of, you know, uh, concrete steps that yeah. Ishiba-san want to take is just for, you know, just the negotiation was the U.S. about uh, the treaty. So I think that's not the solution. Mm -hmm. and but isn't that also incrementalist? Yeah. In the sense of it's still the United States. The choice is still. Yeah, but yeah. his wording, listen, mm -hmm. he, his recent wording is very different from last year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, I sometimes uh, down with him and uh, the, go to the TV show with him, but, uh, well, he, he's leaning towards the right wing. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, kind of anti-U.S. fading right wing. Mm -hmm. So it's a dangerous move. Mm -hmm. And in the private sector, I think the, there's nobody, uh, the, no prominent leaders in private sector that, you know, think about the alternatives, mm -hmm. unlike South Korean society. Yeah, South Korea has a bigger debate. So it's a <laughs> quite dim view, mm -hmm. so I'm sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Can we move to the other big uh, bilateral relationship of importance uh, to Japan, and that has um, been showing some improvement despite the yeah. unresolved history between China and Japan. And, and uh, Abe is visiting Beijing yeah. in the next month or so, and, and Xi Jinping visiting Japan next year, early next year. Hiro, can you give us a sense of what's driving that improvement? Is it what because is they're all nervous, nervous okay. about Trump, or what, what's driving that? Uh, it is very interesting to observe uh, that China's approach to Japan uh, started to change drastically since the, maybe October or November last year. Uh, during APEC and also East Asian Summit, uh, China, of, uh, actually, yeah, Japan and uh, Abe and Xi Jinping's, Xi Jinping's meeting was set in advance. Then China side reached out to Japan and proposed why don't you meet Likoch, Prime Minister Liu Chen also? It is very, very kind of uh, extraordinary, unusual. And then there was a good meeting. And also, uh, Japan and China had a high-level economic, economic dialogue uh, headed by the deputy prime minister. And Japan has been asking China to hold it because it has been uh, suspended for maybe around eight years. So Japan has, has been asking, but China was always cautious. But it is China who initiated the resumption of that talk. So Japan wonder why. And the tentative conclusion is China is so worried about the prospect of US-China relationship and also unpredictability of Mr. Trump in the midst of a trade war or maybe hegemonic war. So they decided to uh, uh, embrace or ease tension with Japan and hopefully wedge, wedge or embrace or wedge between US and Japan, thereby uh, they can deter Trump administration. And also easing tension is a good thing anyway for China. And also they uh, successfully get kind of like a dividend that such as, as I said, Japanese conditional support to a Belt and Road Initiative. And also, Japan is now very willing to push forward RCEP. What is RCEP? In a brief, regional? regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Right. Yeah, now, now Japan is a bit cautious because Japan was pro-TPP. And Japan tried to push TPP. Uh, but uh, 
Now, Abe is willing to conclude the negotiation before the end of this year. And this is a concession to China, I think. Because Japan wanted to push China to TPP standard, but uh, gave up and uh, tried to embrace RCEP, which could be lower stand, uh, which standard is relatively lower to TPP. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that the Trump factor is one of the biggest factors which is uh, bringing impact, the huge, immense impact on, uh, not immense, but big impact on sign on Japan relationship. And what outcomes, Sheila, can we expect from these two very much anticipated meetings, what the one in Beijing and, and in Tokyo next year? Yeah. So I think the Beijing meeting coming up in October, it's the 40th anniversary of commemoration of the, of the implementation of the, the peace treaty, the normalization treaty, the peace and friendship treaty. So there'll be a lot of good rhetoric, I think, surrounding that, and a lot of discussion about the mutual interests and perhaps a little win-win <laughs> as well. Um, I think the, 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 the Thailand project that, um, that Hiro was suggesting, I think there's been a search for an appropriate project that is allowing Japan to help elevate standards of, of some of the OBOR infrastructure and development. I think Japan clearly sees its desire to help raise the standards, be it in infrastructure or even the AIIB in the financial sector. That's where the Japanese feel that that's, that's their role in the economic engagement. I think what's going to be interesting, though, is, again, back to this public opinion, is how the Japanese public opinion will respond to the meeting. One of the things that I've watched over time, and this goes back to the tension, the period of tensions, is the Japanese public po opinion on China has been very insensitive <laughs> to these sort of adjusted opinions. So mm -hmm. even though the economic relationship is back on track, even though the regular diplomacy is back on track, that high level, and 80% is mm -hmm. better than what it was. Three or four years ago, it was 90 something percent were basically antagonistic towards the government of China. So I'll be watching to see if the Japanese public sees this as right. a bigger opening. Right. Right. And Hiro and, and the business community and others will, will applaud it, <laughs> and we should. Um, but I'm not sure that the Japanese public will respond to it. Maybe so maybe that'll be an interesting. Polls. Yes. <laughs> so would you like some? There you go. So that's your opening <laughs> for the numbers. The, the fundamental reason that Japanese majority of Japanese people hate China has a connection to uh, the feeling that their income is decreasing. The personal income, it's, it's a personal status. Mm -hmm. It's not true that richer people uh, like China and the poorer people hate China. That's not true, it's the opposite. But you know, asking uh, if your household income would increase or decrease in the future, there's a clear connection towards the hate uh, toward China. So it's like uh, uh, if the people answers that uh, their income would increase in the future, um, the people who hate China decrease by 24 points. So it's a you know, big connection to that. Mm -hmm. And um, also the Japanese public, uh, part of the Japanese public who makes money was Chinese business, likes China. And the opposite uh, is true also, because the Chinese people who engage the business was Japanese companies, and who finds that that kind of business will uh, glow in the next 10 years. 88% of them likes Japan. That's enormous number. So my theory, my hypothesis is that the economic interdependence in people's level is working. But it's not working well because the China-Japan export input business is controlled by state-owned companies from Chinese side. Right. And the Japanese shosha, I don't know the- Trading <laughs> companies. Trading Trading company. yeah. companies uh, uh, managing the Japanese side business. So it's not <coughs> visible that, you know, the interdependence between China and Japan. Mm. And it's also true to, you know, South Korea-Japan relationship because the most of the business is B2B business. Mm. So it can't be damaged by the diplomatic tensions. So there is a reason in East Asia that we cannot go well with each other. Mm. And it's not improving. 
So what I think is interesting about the, that result is we often think of the deterioration of Japanese public opinion towards China as being nationalistic or about the, the islands or about the pressure or whatever. But if it becomes based on economic, zero-sum interpretations of economic well-being, then we have a much deeper structural problem. And in fact, whatever high-level diplomacy happens may not actually right, fix the, the larger perceptual problem of the future of Japan and China yep. together. So the, the recipe, I think, rather than incrementalist in terms of approach, of, it's an old-school approach to a new challenge with China and the summetry right. and the, you know, the big statements and the win-win. and yeah. It's not working on either side, I think. No. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not a China expert, but I would be willing to guess that our China experts would say it's not actually going to work no. necessarily all that well in but China as well. For me, uh, you know, just, just briefly, uh, Japan, according to Paul, uh, people's uh, mindset, emotion mindset about perception uh, between Japan and South Korea mutually is as bad as that of Japan, China, roughly. But uh, I don't worry so much about Japan, South Korea, because we are both of us a democratic country. But uh, China have a kind of propaganda or disinformation, lack of the freedom of media. So it is very untransparent how public uh, react, Chinese public react. Uh, and why they react that way, why they are very muted now, uh, I don't know. So for me, uh, the poll result in China is a little bit more kind of a source of uh, concern than in poll in South Korea. When, um, we'll go to the floor and get some questions from the audience in a moment. Just one, one last uh, issue to raise and it's been a sensitive one in Australia as well as part of the quadrilateral security wow. dialogue. Is it, is it a step forward? Does it unnecessarily or gratuitously antagonise Beijing? Sheila, what are your thoughts on that? So I think you have different perceptions in each country of the Quad on this. And I think for the South Asian experts in the room, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think India is in very sensitive to the perception that this is an alliance mm. structure, that the Quad is going to institutionalize some kind of mm. military commitment. Um, I suspect Japan is more comfortable, at least on the maritime side, um, that this is a place where presence can be collectively demonstrated, right, on around a certain set of norms and, right. and, and ambitions. Um, the US, I think, again, this goes back to Peter's question to me earlier, I think the US is largely trying to, to find its way. I don't think the United States would mind a little hardening towards China, which is why I answered Peter's question the way I did, which is I'd rather the Trump administration didn't have a full-throated Asia-Pacific doctrine at this moment, and I'm glad it's an economically organized strategy. But I think each of the Quad members have, have slightly different strategic ambitions and slightly different levels of comfort with the military component of what the Quad implies. Yeah. Some questions. Thank you. I'm going to watch you run up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure. Time is running. Ben Ashio, I'm with the Australia Japan Research Center here at Croft. My question is about um, like teasing out the, the limits of defense reform. And, and you've already started to discuss this. As Dr. Smith mentioned, Japanese policymakers have become <coughs> more comfortable with uh, military uh, instruments of power. And Miura-san mentioned in the discussion about the pacifist sentiments on the left, sort of as uh, competing forces here. And that because of this, the Article 9, the Abe government's taken this kaken approach um, to add a third paragraph to explicitly recognize the self-defense forces, but not to change the second paragraph, the renunciation of war. In taking this approach, how much would this actually change fundamentally the day-to-day the -day operations of the self-defense forces, um, the way that they'd be dispatched overseas, and also what are the risks of taking this approach in, in the uh, theoretical circumstance that the public did then voted it down? Right, thank you. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your question. 
And the change of the constitution, if the current draft, will change nothing. And will change nothing in the actual operations of usual basis. But that might change one thing. The SDF will be recognized as a force. They will not say it uh, as a military, but they include the civilian control clause in the draft. And that means the, the, the reform that the other administration was making since 2015, that you know, they changed the con con civilian control um, system in Japan from bureaucratic, bureaucratic control to political control. And that mission will be concluded by changing constitution. Plus, uh, the Japanese diet has no uh, um, meaningful role in controlling a self-defense force. Self-defense force generals are invisible in Japan. They don't answer the questions in diet. They don't go to diet. So the, that culture can be changed afterwards. But the, the, the most important part in changing constitution is to recognize the SDF and try to pressure uh, the, the peace movement people to you know, criticize the SDF. But it's a political movement. Uh, just briefly, uh, if, yeah, Mira san, is, I agree with Mira san mostly. And another one, another consequence is what if they, Japan goes to a referendum and like a Brexit? People, vote, oh, Brexit said yes. Yeah. So if, if, if people said, say no, I think that will have a, also immense impact on the uh, future of constitutional revision. Mm -hmm. you know, it is possible, <laughs> if, especially when Abe tries to change Article 9, though nothing will change, but people get, <laughs> some people get nervous and maybe say no. I don't think that there's going to be uh, another chance in coming maybe years once it happens. That is a potentially big impact, I think. Just a, a very quick question on the use of force and the instrumentality part of your question. I have a book coming that I will send to you. <laughs> um, but, but, but a very short answer is I don't think, I think the constitutional debate over that third paragraph and whatever we're about to see in the diet I don't think the diet debate is going to get us to a national referendum unless the polling is very right, explicitly right, right. in support. Right. So I think there's no danger that we're going to have a diet and a referendum and a no. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think we're going to have a diet debate and a lot of very careful reading <laughs> and parsing of public opinion polling and a pullback yeah. if there's any sense that it's not going to be successful. Yeah. I think they're going to set up a referendum so that it succeeds, yeah. however it I agree. happens. That is a likely scenario. Yeah. But on the use of force on the instrumentality question, I think that's a separate, I don't think many Japanese see that as attached to when the self-defense forces are going to use force. And the conversation that really focused on when the SDF get to use force with others, so the collective self-defense debate, that new legislation in 2015 gave you a very good spread of the thinking on the use of force question. I think a lot of us, including people like Professor Kitaoka, who was on the advisory committee for the collective self-defense reinterpretation, a lot of us felt actually Mr. Abe would take it further than he did. He was very cautious in that legislation. Um, but it fixed a lot of the loopholes that the SDF had already con run into in actual missions. So uh, whether in UN peacekeeping or working with allies or even working with Australians, right? It fixed a lot of the limitations that the SDF was running into. And so it fixed problems that already existed. It didn't change the missions. It didn't give them new missions to perform. It just got rid of the legalistic barriers to the full performance of missions that had already been assigned to the military. So that's in the book. Okay. <laughs> right. But I don't think those two are the same thing. But uh, Shira? Great. Thank you for the, the discussion. Um, I might just come back to the auto tariffs, because Sheila did mention they're coming. I think we can almost count on them, them coming. And Mirasan, your response that Japan will buy more arms and agriculture from the US, um, it, it might be feasible in the short term, but I think wouldn't there be a lot of political pressure to retaliate 
Um, and maybe Japan will weather the storm and, and suffer huge economic loss from these tariffs for the alliance, maybe. Um, but then I, don't, I think Trump is just getting started. The domestic macro policies in, in the US, um, the fiscal expansion, they're going to put pressure on, on the trade deficits are going to grow. Um, US trade deficits are going to grow. So we're looking at potentially more measures, more damaging measures down, down the road. What really are Japan's options? Retaliating doesn't help. I mean, surely Japan needs to look to other countries, um, other partners, even China. Does this sound plausible to you, or is this Japan just has to hold the line and p potentially retaliate? We're all looking at you. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I have an impression that the current administration doesn't have solution. <laughs> and it is a hypothetical solution that uh, talked about, but it's in the private sector, I think. And I don't think that the, uh, well, other administration will be for another three years. So during the administration, I don't think that the Abe-san will fight Mr. Trump. Yeah. And mm. it's for security reasons. They cannot damage the alliance. And they are going to change emperors, and they are going to change constitutions. Mm. They cannot risk the alliance. Yeah, so uh, maybe Japan will perceive it this way. They know, and maybe Washington also knows that it doesn't help to fix the trade imbalance so much. But maybe Japan may think that he is imposing automobile tax to, because he thinks that, uh, it, that's, uh, as I said, balances on the Alliance is too much huge deficit for U.S. He, he said he doesn't want to you know, put the U.S. soldier in the Korean Peninsula in June 6, 12. He wants to withdraw, withdraw from Korea. Maybe it could be possible also in Japan, but he cannot do that. At least he understands he cannot do that. So he tried to punish. So it is not like uh, economic policy, but it's almost like political policy decision which uh, discount the value of US Japan alliance. That could be a reaction in Japan. And so retaliation doesn't help. But maybe that will have more Im immense impact on US Japan, US Japan alliance. And so maybe Japan will try to expand its security cooperation with more, you know, uh, quickly, actively with ASEAN country, uh, Australia, or even uh, NATO. Thereby Japan can offset the damage and also more effort to expand the TPP, to pressure US, but uh, that could not be a solution. <laughs> no. Just a couple of thoughts. There are some intervening variables, right? So it's not a Japan-US conversation, obviously, right? How NAFTA, especially the Canadian piece, gets resolved will, in fact, inform whatever happens with 232. As all of you know, the, the Japanese auto industry is in North America, not just in in the United States. And so Toyota and a whole bunch of other companies will be devastated by a combined f funky response right. to Canada and a very academic term, um, <laughs> and the imposition of 232 tariffs. Right. So I think, I think the Abbey government will have to respond mm -hmm. because I think the Japanese auto industry will be up against the wall. Mm. They will either have to diminish jobs at home mm -hmm. to respond, right? Yeah. And that's a whole other political question about any Japanese prime minister. Are you really willing to hollow out Japanese you know, manufacturing sector and Japanese jobs to satisfy the erratic Mr. Trump? I think there's serious politics at home on this issue that are not just about security treaty versus trade. They're really about the, the ripple effects of that, this decision-making process. Mm -hmm. And I think it starts with NAFTA. And you can see the Canadians. They're not, going to, they're not going to swallow something that is going to create those kind of politics for them at home. And I think no democracy can, mm. right? Mm. So therein lies the various intervening variables. I don't think we can say right now, because it's, the path, it's very path contingent. And I, I don't know that the Trump administration understands as clearly 
as, you have as to Hillary does. Said Trump and Trump and administration. <laughs> or that he cares, right? <laughs> or that he cares. Right. Um, but remember, we have a midterm election in November, so the next couple of months will give us some pretty good markers on both the Trump administration and on the Abe cabinet's thinking on this. Okay. Thank you, sir. And thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentations for each. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm Thomas Atake from National Institute for Defense Studies in Japan. Um, I also wonder why Japan has no alternative or so-called Plan B and the Trump presidency, even if a country like Australia has begun to discuss the so-called Plan B you know, yeah. under the Trump administration. And I don't think the U.S. withdrawal from Japan is likely you know, in the foreseeable future, but surely the U.S. red liberal order uh, it, it will continue to decline, you know. And, and, but nonetheless, uh, as Rudy and uh, Akita-san discussed, the uh, Japanese policymaker seems to be preoccupied with how to maintain the status quo rather than how to prepare for the worst case scenario. And I think that's partly because they see some continuity of the uh, US-China strategic rivalry. And as long as this strategic rivalry between US and China continues, Japan, US-Japan alliance will remain very strong because we are in a very, very you know, important position mm -hmm. in terms of US yeah. strategy against China, um, where Australia might be less important for US in terms of their strategy against China. Um, given that, I'd like to ask a question to uh, Dr. Smith. And how do you see the possibility of the, uh, for example, like uh, a rapprochement between the US and China, a you know, sudden rapprochement? And how, how, let's say, how would Trump uh, respond if China provides some very good deal in terms of a trade, you know, trade war between U.S. and China. How would he respond? What do you think that the U.S.-China rivalry will continue in the foreseeable future? The short answer is I think it's going to continue. I, I think the trade, the imposition of tariffs, I think the, the president probably thought that he would be able to entice the Chinese to the table. I think he was led to believe that, perhaps falsely, by his interaction with Xi Jinping personally. Uh, I don't think the Chinese government is going to buy it. I think they've attempted some kind of deal-making strategy, but not to, not, it, I don't think they see it as a viable way forward. Um, but, so I think that that will continue. I think there's also places, as we all mentioned earlier, that there are places where the Japan-US interests align on China. So whether it's intellectual property rights, or the China 2025 plan, or on Belt and Road, I think we've got some alignment here that, yeah, we ought to put some pressure on China to change the way it behaves, right? Um, but I think the, the real question here is where the president feels he's going to be able to pull back. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't want to make this all about domestic politics in the United States, but it's a lot about domestic politics in the United States. Um, he needs to go into the midterms saying, I won on this, I won on that, and which is partially explains the there's no nuclear threat for North Korea. But on the trade issue, he is not going to relent. And I would say even beyond the midterms, he will not relent. And that's where I think the pressure on Japan is going to be severe. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't think sometimes when I listen to him speak, he can make a difference between China and Japan and the Euro <laughs> European Union and perhaps even Australia, right? In terms of the economic trade objectives that he has, deficit reduction doesn't, doesn't you know, it, it's not a solution. And a free trade agreement is not going to bring it about. But he is stuck on those numbers. So whether it's buying aircraft, energy is another place where the Japanese purchase of shale gas could clearly change the deficit number. There are lots of ways we could work on the deficit number. And I think, it's, it's, I think that's going to be part of the Abe cabinet's response. Mm. But the auto industry is all about the global network of production, right? It's all about the liberal way in which we organize the global economy. It's not just about Japan. And so I think what he's trying to do is de-incentivize that global system of production. And if you listen to Peter Navarro, and the president is now echoing Peter Navarro's thinking uh, much more frequently than ever in the past, and the people who have advocated for the global liberal order are gone from the administration. They have either quit or they've been asked to go. Yeah. So I think this administration is getting to be much more interested in economic nationalism whether or not that tariff tool is effective, he will claim it is effective for political reasons. Mm. So I am not as sanguine on the US-Japan relationship because I think it's going to hurt. And it's not just going to hurt the auto industry, it's going to hurt your own economy sooner or later. 
and that, that's not tolerable, I think, for any Japanese prime minister. I really envy Australia. <laughs> Australia have a trade, defi trade deficit? And we, and, yeah. and we don't notice, right? Trump doesn't really put a lot of spotlight on you. So Australia is exceptionally good. For, you know. We're all coming, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> when things get really bad, just, just move a little place over well, and Daniel, for us. We've got room. No, thank you. Yes. <laughs> any, any other questions? Yeah, yep. Thank you. Two up here. All the way yeah, up, straight you, up straight You up have to run again. Stairs, thanks, yeah. <laughs> good fitness. Yes. Good thing he's young. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ryosuke Hanada, a PhD student at the ANU. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations. My question is quite simple about the nuclear option of Japan. Uh -huh. um, I think you discussed the plan B, I think, in this panel comprehensively, but one missing point or discussion is the fact that Japan will go nuclear if and then under, under what condition. So could you explain how Japan's Japanese government has confidence, to what extent Japan's government has confidence in the U.S. extended deterrence at this moment? And then how much, um, I mean, what, what kind of crisis is necessary for Japan to seriously start a discussion on the nuclear option? That's my question. You, you know the answer, and you're asking a very sensitive question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Japan is under the nuclear umbrella, and it is secure as of now. But one scenario that U.S. will cut a deal with North Korea only by stopping ICBM and do less or do nothing to stop mid-range ballistic, mid ballistic missile, which covers Japan, and also fail to deal with nuclear program. North Korea. What will happen? Japan will dis there is a decoupling between US and Japan. And Japanese people started to feel that, oh, nuclear umbrella is it? You, will US retaliate North Korea when by taking a risk of getting you know retaliated by uh, North Korea and getting hit uh, uh, taking a risk of uh, a nuclear attack from North Korea? because U.S. is safe. So that may lead to a pub, pub, pri, uh, debate among the public, uh, not among, among uh, private scholars, like Amira-san, about the uh, you know, possible nuclear option. But I think that there is a ladder. One is to allow U.S. Uh, air, US aircraft which can carry nuclear bomb to allow them to land in Japan in times of contingency. This is a level one. Level two is to uh, allow US to introduce US nuclear missile or B61 type of a, uh, missile, a bomb on the land of Japan. And third is a West Germany type two key, under the two key system uh, Japan and U.S. will share the nuclear capability. And fifth is a nuclear sharing like uh, U.K. and U.S. are doing. So, you know, jump on the last <laughs> step is crazy, I think, last in French type of nuclear capability. It is, in, in, it is I think, it's a crazy idea. But the, maybe there's going to be a discussion, not in the government, but among scholars or experts. Well, um, about the, the confidence, Japanese people's confidence in the nuclear umbrella is, you know, it depends on the issues. The fifth, only 15% of Japanese public believes that U.S. will intervene in the Senkaku Island conflict in case of China's invasion. So it's a very limited number. Comparing uh, considering that the South Korea's 55% of the public believes that the U.S. will intervene in North Korean crisis. So Japanese people don't believe in the nuclear umbrella in case of the peripheral issues, but they also don't have the fear of abandonment. So that's the key point. because. Well, last night I hear a lot about the Australian politics and uh, 
they say that the Australians are fear of you know abandonment risk, but Japanese uh, society has no such fear. Well, they fear the entrapment, right? Well, going to the other side of the world kind of uh, argument, and. My poll shows that 25% um, of Japanese public wants to get out of the nuclear umbrella of the US and remain non-nuclear. So this is a pacifist segment. This is quite big. And another 25% of the public wants to remain under the umbrella. And 11% uh, of the public wants the nuclear sharing. And that's a you know, um, big word, though. And 8% of the people want to have their own nuclear weapons. So this is the current status yeah. of Japanese public opinion. And it, the poll was conducted uh, last year, December. So this is a recent uh, uh, outcome of my research. So answering your fundamental question, when Japan goes to nuclear option is when the US definitely retreats from East Asia. So Japanese public don't fear of abandonment risk because they think that the US base will be kept in Okinawa or other regions in, in Japan. So even pacifist believes in that. So whenever I, you know, talk about the fear of abandonment, the far left uh, people criticize me of speaking a demagogue uh, kind of theory. So it is, you know, we are all dependent on nuclear umbrella. So I don't know uh, the, when the US will, you know, retreat from East Asia. There is no sense of talking about you know risking NPT because there isn't such thing you know exists in that kind of era. So we shouldn't worry about NPT then. So we only should worry about the total withdrawal of the U.S. Just to, to try to address your question in a slightly different way. Um, and again, it's important to think about the Japanese public's perception of the effectiveness of the extended deterrent versus the security planning or expert, right? So again, back to your plan B question, I think there's a lot more quiet conversation among the expert community that may not be in the public domain, right? There's some that I know of, may not be policy relevant, but they are talking. Um, but the nuclear one for me is people often don't understand the Japanese government has reviewed its nuclear options periodically over the post-war period. This is not a conversation that doesn't happen in Japan, right, among the planning or the serious policymakers. So when China uh, developed the hydrogen bomb in the 60s, it was a question. When Japan was going to sign on to the MPT, it was a serious question. Mm. Um, when, it became, when the Cold War ended, there was another policy review. So there have been periodic reviews of when is it okay for our security if we do not, if we exclude the nuclear option. And when you get a couple of responses, I mean, it's always been yes, right, um, so far. Doesn't mean it's always going to be, right? And um, so there's two pieces of the puzzle here. When does it make sense for Japan? And then what kind of nuclear option makes sense, which is what Hiro was going through, right? But I think for the most part, the military planners think that the only configuration of nuclear capability that would be sufficient for Japan or make sense for Japan's security would be the force to frap, the, you know, the SLBM force that's offshore. Japan is too narrow for any kind of other strategic option for missiles and or for bombers, right? So it's always that. It's always in the function of deterrence, never in war fighting, right? Until it gets to the alliance. And then the question of tactical nuclear weapons by the United States, will it help deter aggression against Japan or will it help us fight a war? And I think we're not yet, yet there, unlike the political debate in South Korea, where tactical nukes are part of the conservative right debate, it is not part of the political debate in Japan. Mm -hmm. And I, part of it may be the nuclear allergy, part of it, it just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. you know? And so the debate that you do here in Japan, and it is a politically informed debate, is in the LDP committee's review of a conventional strike option. Right? And that is still presented as a retaliatory capability. 
so that there is no miscalculation on the part of Pyongyang or Beijing that Japan will not respond. So having the capability so that other people won't take advantage of you or feel that they can take advantage of you is still the logic, and even for conventional strike. But that we're having that debate inside the LDP, inside a policy-relevant committee, suggests to me that we are on the cusp of some pretty substantial change. Will the public like a conventional strike? Probably not. But if North Korea behaves in a way, or if the United States behaves in a way that it makes sense, then I think the Japanese policy community will, will be able to present it as necessary for Japanese defense. We have time for one more. Thank you. Hi, Matthew Lentini. I'm a local here at ANU. Quick question that might be a bit of a segue there. Um, Japan's no stranger to maritime disputes. So I'd like to know the optics in Japan around issues that China ends up having with its neighbors that aren't Japan, like whether it be Vietnam or case in point possibly uh, the Philippines, where there will be a maritime dispute, there might be an issue of someone capitulating to the other, US involvement or lack thereof. So how does Japan see this and how does that affect either levels of anxiety or policy uh, formulation? Thanks. Who would like to pick that? I, I, I wrote about this in the, in the, in the book on the Japan-China. <laughs> but, but, but it's important to understand that the Japanese supported strongly the Philippines' claim under UNCLOS that resulted in the arbitration, under, <coughs> under arbitration outcome that basically said Chinese behavior in both maritime regions, right, EEZs, as well as its, its behavior across maritime boundaries was not in accordance with the UNCLOS, right? Mm -hmm. So it supported the outcome. Um, it supported the use of international law to, to mediate and to rule on an outcome. It continues to do that officially. I don't think that there is a, um, there is a Japanese position on any one dispute, but clearly <coughs> coercive behavior by the Chinese is, is of concern to the Japanese. And I think that's why, in some ways, you see more maritime presence around Southeast Asia by Japan, by the Maritime Self-Defense Forces, but also by the Coast Guard engagement with Southeast Asian nations as well. So I think you've got a forward-leaning Japanese policy conversation to help the Philippines, for example, or Vietnam, and India, for that matter, develop their own ability to provide coastal defenses. So you have some, some provision of Coast Guard ships. You have training by the Coast Guard and sometimes by the Maritime Self-Defense Forces and others to help the capacity of Southeast Asian states that have intrusions by Chinese into their maritime region. So that's where I've seen the Japanese policy response. On ASEAN side, I traveled to uh, ASEAN last week and, and attended some conference, small conference. And on ASEAN side, too, there are a lot of kind of desire for Japan to engage more, not militarily, but especially uh, engage to st uh, strengthen their coast guard capability. So Japan is, uh, Japanese maritime um, coast guard is expanding budget to uh, support ASEAN country mainly to build its coast guard vessels, or also training. Um, they s set up special unit only to support those kind of, uh, only to you know, engage that kind of assistance to ab abroad. So I think, yeah, as he, she said, there is more, uh, more and more uh, activity which gonna be, will be seen. Yeah. Okay, Sheila, Lily, Hiro, thank you very much. Please put your hands together. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.